from a, I guess, practical setting, what would be some of your favorite um, sort of exercises when it comes to mitigating hamstring injuries? I think it's from a, an outcome of this, what's the better exercises for this, the better exercise for that. And there's always going to be three or four things that will give you what you want. But then you, I think you, if you know the adaptation you want to drive, if the adaptation is to reduce injury risk, well, there's two or three exercises we know in the Nordics. One of those, the other one's run fast. If you do an eccentric exercise and you run fast, you'll probably be in a good space. But then there's so much in that that gets kind of lost sometimes in that, oh, if I just do two sets of four Nordics and I run fast once a week, I'll be sweet. I'll do that in 40 weeks. For someone that is looking to, maybe they're below the 400 newtons uh, or they're below what they're perceived as, you know, eccentric strength, uh, max force is, is an issue for them and they want to work on that. Um, do you feel for bang for buck, minimum effective dose, like you mentioned, it's the weighted Nordic in that aspect or do you use tempo type of work where they're trying to really um, extend how long they can hold that eccentric contraction for? Uh, so more your lower rep sort of stuff, quality over volume, or, or do you or do you just need to go through a program where you you do do high volume work, high frequency, maybe two three times a week, and then start to ramp up the intensity once you've got that um, base underneath you. Yeah, I guess yeah, it, it's it could go either way, right? I think um, one thing with the Nordic is a lot of people, especially if they're practicing it or just doing training, most of them will just spend a lot of time early to phase. Get to here and drop. Spend all their time. Whereas, in there. yeah, short. And, and then they're gone on a gas by here. Whereas, if you just ignore that and you kind of dive out to here and then you slam the brakes on as you go and you get stronger in that outer range, that adaptation's probably going to be better from a longer term, from a strength data perspective. It also means that if you get out to here and say you can't get out to there, right? So, a lot of people get to this point and go up two weeks and go drop. Um, that's where you probably can make the most out of a higher frequency, more tempo kind of base thing. Just get smaller range of motion, greater amount of reps, get stronger, and then try and get out longer. What would be some of your big rocks? Uh, and maybe we'll go with a community-based athlete. So what are some key areas that maybe perhaps they're a week or two down, the physios ticked them off to they're ready to run and, and do their strength work. Um, so they're pain-free from that aspect. We have where would you like to start with them in the gym and on the field? Um, like I said, the high speed running is a very underappreciated thing because we can't control it half the time, especially in that community level sport. You can't really, it's hard to uh, 90% fast, you know, fast mate. Um, to that level, you can top up, you know, over 20 years, the time can be different. So we focus on doing the gym, doing that space, we can control that a lot more. Um, so I just think, um, yeah, I think running, I think a good, a good thing in, in my mind is now the sprint pain free, but whilst you say you're pain free in the assessment of the clinic, sprinting pain free and having no apprehension open up is, is a big thing. They're, they're kind of different things. Like you'd be made pain free on movement and outcomes and whatever, but if you can get out of the field. And you thought you can't get over that 90% because you're just apprehensive or you, you don't feel like you have the kind of like capacity to do it. Then I think that might be a good gauge of, and might need a bit more work, a bit more time. What are some common, I guess, trends that you see with, with athletes that have had a bad run? Um, what if you sort of learned by having the finger on the pulse from that sense to, I guess, converse, we could try and prevent athletes getting to that point. Um, I guess, again, you're looking at it, uh, the prescription becomes a big thing as well. Um, so you're looking at it and you might try to help, help organizations and individuals and they might say, here's the program for the last couple of months. And they say they're doing heavy exercises, but it might be variations of Bosch holes, it might be isometric stuff, and then, um, yeah, that it might tickle some eccentric work a little bit, but most of it's a variation of an RDL or they might do a, a back extension where it's 45 degree back extension, concentric, eccentric. So you're looking at it, you got a lot of handy exercises, a good five or six or seven handy exercises there, but there's no eccentric overload. So where's that eccentric overload coming from? 
Is there anything on this topic in terms of mitigating hamstring injuries and helping return to play that you'd like to touch on right before we wrap it up? Um, I think, yeah, from my end, and some people go over complicated stuff and chucking them a few different exercises and training the glutes to do this and do switches and isometrics and all that stuff is great. But we know the evidence suggests do eccentric training, do it regularly, run fast, do it regularly, get strong, overload, progress, run fast, overload, progress. You do that, I think at a base level, it'd be pretty sweet and you'd probably be doing a lot better than most professional sports. Some teams just, because obviously you fixtures, knees, hips, backs, all those things. Eccentric regularly, run fast regularly, and be consistent. I think you'll take up a lot of the adaptations while I drive. 